Good evening. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how you can leverage APRS to help your team uh, perform search and rescue operations more efficiently, more accurately, and more quickly. In order to do this, I have to talk briefly about how APRS works. There's plenty of videos out there on the internet that discuss this topic and a lot of written documentation. I am going to touch briefly on the subject just so everybody has a common understanding of how APRS works before we go deeper into how you can apply it to search and rescue operations. We're also going to talk about problems that exist in SAR ops and how APRS can be used to correct or at least improve some of these issues. And then after I give you these general examples, I'll give you some specifics, specific examples. And if I have uh, convinced you to explore this further, some practical operating tips is how I'm going to close out so you can implement some of this knowledge. Our primary. APRS, in short, is a packet reporting system. Some people errantly call it automatic position reporting system, but that's not the true name. And the reason that's not the true name is it, it's not just positions that get conveyed through these packets. However, that is the most common payload for a packet on the APRS network. This technology is not new. It's been out there for over 30 years. It's a burst transmission, most often conveyed over VHF or UHF frequencies, though there is some APRS use on the HF bands in amateur radio. In a nutshell, APRS is about communicating to people who's around me, what frequencies are they on, and where are they located in relation to my current position. Capabilities of APRS allow you to see who's in range of you on voice. Generally speaking, if you've received their digital packet, then uh, you more than likely can reach out to them on voice as well, depending on the repeaters that are available in your area. You can track an asset's position. You can broadcast information via text from radio to radio. In our county, this includes repeater frequencies and locations so that people traveling through on the interstate system will know what repeaters are available and what repeater they need to shift to based off of their current location. In addition to that, we display the tones for those particular re repeaters and information on when we hold our nets and regular meetings within the county. Something else that happens in the state of Tennessee based off the programming of one of the amateurs in the Middle Tennessee region is if you're traveling through via interstate, you can receive traffic or advisories. If TDOT publishes on their website that a lane or a road has been shut down, that information is automatically conveyed over the APRS radio network. You can also get weather advisories this way from the National Weather Service. There have been times where I've been driving and all of a sudden a polygon shows up on my map with a icon indicating severe weather and let me know that the advisory has been issued for that particular area and give me situational awareness of what area is covered in relation to where I'm at at that particular point in time. You can interface with the WinLink network through APRS, send emails uh, throughout the world. You can send text messages and not just text messages between radios, but if you can get to an internet gateway, which we'll talk about later, you can also get off to the cell phone uh, text. Um, you can send a text message through the cellular network. We talked about the weather alerts, and you can also use it to help share bearing information, signal strength, if you're doing direction finding or fox hunting. Now, how does this apply to search and rescue operations? Well, take that situational awareness piece, and you can very easily start to imagine a situation where you can track um, the searchers as individual assets out in the field, or maybe as they make their way to the staging area from another county or another state. If a searcher stops responding on the voice frequencies and you're worried about their safety and you want to dispatch individuals to that location, you can quickly identify the searcher's last known position based off the last received APRS packet. Now, yes, you can do this based off of uh, voice reports that you'd received of where they had been located, but since APRS can uh, report the, the uh, location very frequently, it could be 30 seconds, 60 seconds, every five minutes, however you set the equipment to report, it's very likely that you could have a more current APRS packet than you have a voice message indicating the last known position. And because this reporting is shifted to a frequency that nobody is using for voice communications, it keeps your voice channel clear for more pressing information. Now there are limitations. 
And these packets are uh, very fragile and, and basically if you have two packets that are transmitted by two different stations at the same time, they'll step on each other and cancel each other out. There's no error correction in APRS. <clears throat> Excuse me. No error correction. So if the receiving station receives a garbled packet, there's no request for that packet to automatically be resent by the sending station. It's just lost. Now, part of the thinking in the APRS network is that packets are transmitted so frequently that the loss of any one, two, three packets is not detrimental to the mission. You'll get new packets shortly thereafter. But you've got to keep in mind that packet delivery is not guaranteed. If somebody falls out of radio range, there's nothing that you can do to recover those packets that are being transmitted but not received. Now, because all this uh, traffic is usually taking place on one designated frequency, for uh, a region in North America, that would be 144.39 megahertz. You will be competing with other assets outside your search. There are ways around this. You can switch to another frequency, but you lose the benefit of some of the digipeters and the internet gateways that are in the area. We'll talk about what those are more in a moment. So how does it work? This is a snapshot from the website, APRS.fi. What you see depicted here is a um, a map in time of South Davidson County, which is where Nashville, Tennessee is located, Northeast Williamson County, and Northwest uh, Rutherford County. All the icons you see displayed on this map is a snapshot in time from actually two years ago of the APRS network in this area. There are multiple objects that you can see on this map. I'm only going to focus on three in order to give you a basic understanding of how APRS works. The first one we're going to talk about is the digipeter or digital repeater. Essentially think of this like a voice repeater, but instead of conveying voice traffic, it is taking those digital packets, repeating them a second or two later with new routing information and rebroadcasting that usually with the benefit of increased height and increased power relative to what the sending station was using. The next bit of infrastructure is the internet gateways. The internet gateways are almost always depicted with a black diamond. They can have an eye for in, uh, internet, or they can use a, another letter or number to indicate if they're bi-directional, how many hops they participate in, uh, if they are also a digipeter. Don't get too wrapped up on this. Basically think digipeters are repeaters, eye gates, hear packets, and transmit that information to the internet so that more people can access that information on the other side of the world or just across your state. The last object we're going to talk about, I've used one icon to represent this object, but this could be any type of mobile device. It could be a vehicle mobile, pedestrian mobile, an HT, doesn't matter what it is. The icon could be a car, a truck, a Jeep, a tractor trailer, a person running on foot, a bicyclist, it doesn't matter. These are the bulk of the network, those stations that are moving and conveying their information through APRS. And let me give you a couple examples to, to illustrate how these three types of objects interact in the world. So in this example, they open up the laser pointer. In this example, this particular vehicle is traveling east of Franklin. At either a uh, pre-designated time every couple minutes or whenever the vehicle makes a, a large change in direction or speed, the APRS rig in this vehicle is going to send off a packet. The packet is going to consist of a call sign, a position uh, conveyed through GPS coordinates, and maybe some comments that were pre-programmed into the radio. Well, this can be anything that the operator wants to convey. That message gets sent out and based off of the strength and the efficiency of the antenna on this particular rig, this red circle is indicating what area heard directly that packet. You'll see that three vehicles here to the north and two to the southwest heard that packet directly. And depending on the setup in their vehicle, they may instantly see that vehicle's information displayed on their radio head. You also have a digipeter that heard that packet. Now, that packet does not die at that, that particular point in time. Now that the digipeter has heard it, it's going to get a second life. So that digipeter hears the packet, checks the packet to see if the originating station has requested that it be retransmitted. We talk about this in terms of hops. 
and it will rebroadcast that packet with a little more height, usually, and a little more strength, usually, to cover a larger footprint. Now, because this vehicle is traveling in Williamson County, there's a linked repeater system. And this vehicle, if they got on the voice frequency, could easily hit any of these radios and beyond. Uh, for APRS, though, we're re relying on this digipeter to get their position information out. You'll see now that it's been rebroadcast. We have more than just the original three vehicles hearing that particular packet and displaying that information to their operators. You have all these vehicles up here to the north that are getting that packet for the first time just a second or two later after the original packet was sent. <coughs> there is a third of order effect in this particular scenario as well. You'll see that one mainline digi picked up that uh, rebroadcasted packet and this fill-in digi also received it. I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds on what a fill-in is, but basically this is a smaller digibeater that was designed to fill in a gap in coverage because of a, a ridge uh, between this particular digi and the interstate. If it's not the first station to hear the packet, it won't rebroadcast it. So this digibeater is going to drop that packet and not rebroadcast it. However, this digibeater has checked the packet and seen that the packet has requested two hops. The first one performed here, and now the second one is going to be performed by this digipeter. Simultaneously, you have an eye gate that heard that, that particular packet. So let's see what happens next to that packet. Because another hop has been requested, this digipeter is going to send off that packet. So anyone driving along 840 to the southwest or out towards Fairview is now going to get that packet. That's going to be the end of the life of the packet on the RF side. On the internet side, because the iGate has received it, it's going to pass that information off so that websites like APRS.FI can display that information. Or a loved one, family member, could be reviewing uh, where you're at at a given point in time if they're worried about you, if you're running late, whatever the case may be. There is another way that that packet can get out on the RF side, and that is if the originating packet was uh, intended for this driver here. If the packet had been programmed with this call sign as the intended recipient, once the packet was received by the eye gate, this eye gate would identify that it had received a position report from this call sign, the intended recipient, within its footprint. And knowing that it's within its footprint, this eye gate could send that packet that's on the internet out via the radio so that this driver could receive it, even though the physical distance between the two drivers is too great for the APRS packet to get out. Here's another example. The originating, um, the originating operator does not have to be located at the position uh, that an object is created. Here's a weather example. So let's say the same driver is on a weather net. They're driving home at a time they probably shouldn't be. And while they're driving, they encounter flooding on an internet, uh, Interstate 65. They turn around, they go somewhere safe, and once they're somewhere that they can safely report the information, they convey this via voice on the local weather net. An operator at this particular home has an APRS rig and is, both list is also listening to the weather net. Now that they have a location, a mile marker, for example, of this flooding event, this operator can choose to convey that information via APRS so that people that are just traveling through the, the area and may not know about the weather net can still learn about this information. Uh, simply, uh, you know, this operator, all they have to do is click on their map, drop the icon for the flood. They can put uh, in the comments who the originating station was, who reported it, and a time date stamp on it. And now all the vehicles that are traveling in this area could receive this. this. This packet could show up on their uh, radio head so that they can see that there's flooding on this interstate and they need to avoid it. So now that you understand a little bit about how APRS works, we're going to try to apply the strengths of APRS to some problems that exist in search and rescue operations. Problem number one, searchers operating uh, can operate outside of their assigned areas. A lot of times this is completely unintentional. So you've got your incident commander or you've got a planner who has designated particular areas for individuals and teams to search. So you're a searcher, you go out to the field, you believe you're searching your assigned sectors or routes. 
However, through a navigation error, through uh, poor transcription of coordinates, this searcher is not operating in their assigned area. As a result, that assigned area may go completely unsearched. Or if the incident commander is reviewing or one of his staff, his or her staff is reviewing the GPS tracks from that searcher, they may determine that a mistake has been made, but at that point, time has been lost. It may not be until after the that particular um, operational period that that problem is identified, and now people have to be redispatched back to that area to make sure that area was covered. With APRS, you solve this problem because if the searcher is equipped with a radio that's reporting their position in near real time, the net control operator can compare those positions to the assigned sectors and can identify uh, whether they're operating outside of their assigned area or not. The second problem is uh, the last known position of a searcher can be too old or it can be completely inaccurate. This could be through an error in reporting by the searcher. Uh, either they looked at their map and they came up with the wrong coordinate or they looked at their GPS and as they were relaying that information via voice, they may have misreported some numbers or the receiving station may have misheard, miswrote, or misplotted that information. Not only that, but in order to keep the voice net clear, the SOP of the group may be to only report once every 15 minutes, 30 minutes. It really depends on the team. As a result, your last report could be fairly old by the time you realize that something's wrong. With APRS, the radio is constantly reporting. Again, depending on the way the radio is configured and the SOP for the team, it could be once every 30 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, however long you want. Knowing that it's not going to jam up the voice frequency, that's going to leave you a little bit freer to report more frequently. And also keep in mind that that particular searcher isn't having to um, take their eyes off of the area that they're searching to look at their map. Uh, for more frequent reporting purposes, obviously they're going to be checking in that map to make sure that they're still oriented with the train, um, but it's going to keep their head up a little bit more often. The second problem is uh, a lot of search teams will use something like a Garmin radio because it provides them with voice and with position reporting very similar to APRS. However, there are some distinct drawbacks to using this equipment. Other teams will use subscri uh, subscription-based trackers. These are usually satellite-based. Uh, these are you know, awesome for extremely remote locations. However, they do have some drawbacks, and of course we're going to talk about those here. The Garmin Rhino, because they are uh, using GRMS and FRS frequencies, only one of those bands requires any sort of license and that license is handled with a simple postage uh, postcard application. Because of this, they're very popular, but because the bar to entry to the radio frequencies is so low, the FCC has restricted the power and the ability to change out antennas on those particular devices. So right out the gate, you're transmitting with a low power, much lower than you would deal with with an amateur radio HT, or if you're in a really remote area, you may be using Manpack mobiles in order to push out more power. You can't do that with a Rhino. Another thing you can't do with a Rhino is you can't benefit from an expanded network using digipeters or eye gates to overcome train or distance. You can't modify the antenna. Those antennas are uh, built onto the devices so that they won't come off and that's one of the requirements from the FCC. And on the subscription-based satellite trackers, you're talking about a significant expense. And according to NASAR, 95% of searchers are volunteers, so this is probably an expense that's outside of their budget. We're talking about a monthly subscription fee for these satellite-based trackers. So now that we've talked about um, some of the problems that I believe can be fixed or at least helped with APRS, I want to give you some concrete use case examples. The first one up is monitoring search progress. And we've talked about this before, but now I just want to help you visualize it. So we're going to use a very basic example. Don't get too wrapped up in the search area, but the search area has been identified as extending uh, east of Nolansville Road and west of McCandless Road. We have our searchers dropped off by vehicle at three search points or start points, and we've designated release points. 
all searchers have been handed a map and a compass, and they've essentially been given a west-east azimuth to follow. And, or maybe they've been handed a GPS with tracks that gives you something more precise that they're supposed to search. You have your searchers get out. These could be individuals with a radio. These could be two-person teams, three-person teams, one radio per team, whatever it may be. You've got seven reporting radios in this particular scenario, and we'll just uh, talk about them in terms of one through seven from north to south. Once they turn on their radios, the GPS receives a lock. Um, they're going to start sending out packets, and those packets are going to be received by the net control station. As they're traveling along, the net controller can keep an eye on them, kind of an eye in the sky view. And very early on, we see that Station 2 has strayed outside of their assigned search area. Now, this uh, could be on purpose. Maybe this hilltop was too steep and the searcher's having to go around, or maybe uh, as people can be prone to do, they drift with the train and the, uh, the searcher and it starts drifting to the north around this hilltop. This would not be identified out without the use of APRS until after the searcher got back, more than likely, and his or her tracks had been reviewed. However, in this case, the net control operator can identify the problem and radio via voice and let them know that they've strayed off path. And then that searcher can correct based off that information. So we haven't lost too much time along the way. Searcher can resume their pre-programmed route. The second example is transmitting updated coordinates. And this is coordinates that can be thrown out either while the search is ongoing or coordinates as your searchers are still traveling to the staging area. In this particular example, we're in the same spot in Williamson County. And uh, you have your searchers that are in the middle of their search and your search organizer, based off of questioning of witnesses, friends and family members of the search subject, has come up with a new last known point or LKP. This information could be conveyed via voice. The searchers in the field could pull out a pen or pencil, a piece of paper, write down that coordinate. They can then take the protractor and uh, plot out that particular coordinate on the GPS, this slows them down. There's uh, ample error or ample opportunities for error. There's another way that you could do this. The net controller could make a voice announcement, heads up, we got a new LKP for your situational awareness, and then they could immediately push out those coordinates as an APRS packet. Now, if the searchers wanted to then take those coordinates from the packet and plot them on their map, they're certainly free to do so. It might even be recommended to do so so that they have a more durable log of that particular information. But now you're not tying up the net with an eight or 10 digit coordinate. Um, it is being displayed in digits on the radio and there's one less opportunity for somebody mishearing a digit or, um, or a part of that message uh, being distorted in transmission. An added bonus, depending on the quality of the radio that the searcher is using, uh, they can see this graphically depicted on a map in relation to where they are currently located. If nothing else, they're given a direction and distance on most HTs to that new point. Now let's say that this new point, in this case, we're going to say it's the just formed incident command post. This did not exist when the searchers were dispatched. They were given a general location to report into, but while they were traveling down the interstate, uh, they received updated information via the voice net and on APRS that showed them, hey, they just stood up the incident command post, uh, coordinates to follow. You see it displayed here on APRS Droid. This could be something pulled off the internet or APRS Droid could be hooked up to a radio to graphically display what is being received over the radio side. Or if you want a strictly radio-based solution, you've got here at the bottom a Yezu FTM 400 that has received that third party object. Again, we talked about that before. You don't actually have to have any of your searchers at the ICP at that point. You just have to have somebody with a radio capable of creating those third party objects who has the coordinates and is able to build it and transmit it. In this particular case, you see there's a comment information that's displayed here. It could be a point of contact's name. Uh, it could be uh, any number of things that you wanted to, to convey as a 
a digital packet. And then the other radio that's displayed here is a Yaesu FTM 400 DR. So the handhelds can get in on the game as well. You've got the direction, cardinal uh, direction, you've got the distance, and then you've got the coordinates. Third example, redirecting the search in progress. Let's say, let's go back to that Nolensville example. People are traveling along, the net control station notices that one of the teams we have not received an updated position report from them in some time, or we are receiving updated reports from them, but the location hasn't changed. The net controller can come on the voice frequency and call for team seven, ask if they need assistance. Nobody responds. Team six could then be directed to go to team seven's last known position. Now, this could happen by relaying the coordinates via voice or because of the proximity of Team 6 to Team 7, it's virtually guaranteed that Team 7 has received packets directly from, I'm sorry, Team 6 has received packets directly from Team 7, and they probably have received more packets from Team 7 because of their proximity to Team 7. In this particular map, we don't have an icon that represents where the net control station is, but more than likely, Team 6 has been closer to 7 this entire time. Team 7 can then just pull up that station from their station list on their radio and then get a direction arrow that's constantly updated and a distance that's constantly ticking down as they close with and try and locate Team 7. Example 4, overcoming terrain and distance. When we were talking, when we were talking about the rhinos, we talked about the fact that uh, you had no options for digipeters and eye gates if the communication leader or COML as looking at the assigned search area and determines that because of train or distance that the APRS network is not going to be able to effectively cover all the searchers, you can, you can deploy a supplemental gear out to the field. In this case, a digipeter is dropped on this particular hilltop and based off of re reviews of the train, it is determined that this will fill in the gaps that might exist in this particular area. And then the last one is, you got vehicles in route, you want to uh, inform them of where the staging area is, we talked about that earlier, or you're at the staging area and you want to know how far out the other members of your team are. In this particular example, a third party or first party object has been created at Prentice Cooper State Park. And this particular um, icon is representing a staging area. And then here on Interstate 24, heading southwest or southeast, I'm sorry, you've got your, uh, your last searcher to report in. You can see how far they are. You can click on their icon, and depending on how their rig is set up, you could see what speed they're traveling to let you know if they're stuck in traffic or if they're humming right along. You can see a time date stamp to let you know how recent this particular packet was to know if you're looking at something that's live or nearly live, or maybe they're further along in the trip and they've just hit a dead spot in the APRS network, you could also deduce that too if say this packet was last received 30 minutes ago and no new updates since then. Okay, so let's say that I've swayed you into using APRS for search and rescue operations. I wanna give you some practical operating tips that will help you be more efficient in the field. First up is you're probably going to center around a handheld uh, transceiver, or an HT couple things to keep in mind, especially in those last scenarios where we talked about receiving information or transmitting information while in route. We all know that an HT is not going to be as effective as a mobile radio. However, we may not realize how bad an APRS radio can be when it's inside a vehicle. We try to compare our experience with the HT to what we've experienced using the voice frequencies. But I can tell you from experience that a voice uh, transmission is a lot easier to understand when it's marginal, when it's being restricted by the metal envelope that is a vehicle. You can make out your brain can fill in some gaps, some breaks in that transmission. For an APRS packet, if there are any breaks or uh, scratchiness or gaps in that packet, the packet is completely lost. What you're seeing here, two separate drives on the same route. One starting just outside Franklin and ending uh, just southwest of Manchester. 
Uh, both are the same routes, same time of day on different days. In the picture on the left, you have an HT that's sitting at, in the passenger seat, just propped up, sitting upright, um, but no external antenna. On the map on the right, you have the exact same radio, but this particular radio is hooked up to a mag mount antenna on the outside of the vehicle. Same transmitting power, same four watts on this particular HT, but you can see there is a dramatic change in the efficiency of this radio and the ability of the larger network to receive those packets. In this particular example on the left, you have one, two, three packets received. There were no packets received on 840, there were no packets received on 24, and as a result, the APRS network assumed straight line distance between these two points, and that obviously was not the case. In this example, even though just using four watts, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 packets received. Still not great, but a much better um, idea of where this vehicle is as it's moving to the staging area. So let's try and improve on this a little bit more. All right, so now you've got what was the picture on the right on the last slide is now the picture on the left. It's the HT with external antenna. Now compare that to a full-size mobile radio with a good 5 eighths wavelength antenna. I'm not even going to try to count all the position reports that were received by the APRS network and ultimately made their way to an eye gate so that this information could be displayed on APRS.FI. Lots of packets received in route. Now, we talked a lot about vehicles there and we talked about handhelds in vehicles. What about handhelds in the field or even mobile radios at a lower power running off of, a, you know, say a deep cycle battery, a seven amp hour battery or something larger? You're willing to take that, that weight hit. How are you going to work on the efficiency of the antenna? There have been several people that have made antennas specifically for this purpose. What I've displayed here is a picture of, a, an, of an antenna that's hooked up to an HT radio. This particular antenna was produced by a group of folks in New Zealand who are all about uh, trying to advocate for the use of APRS in search and rescue operations. You can find out more about this particular group and some of their findings in SARTRAC or on the website SARTRAC.NZ, November Zulu, New Zealand. All right, so let's say I've sold you on the use of APRS in search and rescue operations in order to increase speed, accuracy, and efficiency. APRS radios can be quite expensive, particularly if you're looking for a radio with two VFOs, one of them dedicated to APRS and featuring an internal TNC or terminal node controller, basically the modem that takes the information uh, and, and converts it from uh, digits to sound or reverses it once again. There are some low cost interim solutions that you can use for testing purposes or until you can save up the money to get one of these uh, more efficient all-in-one HTs. If you go to the website WCARES, which is Williamson County Amateur Radio Emergency Service.org, go in the special interest area and look at the APRS information. You'll find two projects. The project on the right is called Hardwired Cell, and the project on the left is called Bluetooth TNC. I'll start with the one on the right at first. This is the absolute cheapest way that I've found to get into APRS. You find a buddy who has an Android a smartphone that they're not using, doesn't have cellular service anymore, and is collecting dust in a junk drawer. You can usually find these type of uh, smartphones, these uh, smartphones that are three, four years old, for as low as 20 bucks. You get APRS Droid, you put it on the device, and at that point you're just using the device as a handheld computer with a built-in GPS and a touch screen. You can download offline street maps, take them anywhere you go, and you don't need a cellular connection. This particular setup has Wi-Fi in it, but that's it. Once it's out in the field, it's, it's relying completely off of those downloaded maps. Uh, APRS Droid has several ways that they can connect to radios or to the internet. In this particular uh, setup, I've switched it to the mode um, audio frequency shift keying. In other words, it's taking 
the audio input from the radio, you see that I've created a custom built cable to attach to the audio input and outputs on this handheld radio. When it hears those APRS packets, it's using what's basically a virtual TNC to decode or encode that information. And essentially you've got a very inexpensive uh, APRS setup. The downside here is primarily you've now tied up this entire HT. You would need a second HT in order to do voice communications, even though this HT has two VFOs because you've tapped into the audio input and output uh, that second VFO is lost to you, you should shut it off so that it doesn't conflict with the APRS packets that are coming and going. Now, over here on the left, you've got a slightly more elegant solution, uh, a little more accurate solution than this homemade cable. This is a Bluetooth-based TNC from a company called MobiLinked, MobiLinked.com. You can find out more about this particular product and find links to the website on wcares.org. But what you see is the same program, APRS Droid, in an offline street map setup, communicating via Bluetooth to this TNC and to this radio. So this radio could be in your backpack. You don't have hands on it, you turn it on when you start the search. This phone could be in your hands as you're searching or in your pocket. You just have to pull out your pocket, turn on the screen to look at where you are and look at where all the other searchers are in relation to you. Now, having said that, these are interim solutions only. I wouldn't recommend these as your first line options. There are much better options for what we're talking about. In general, my recommendation is to get a purpose built device. Now, there are several devices that are popular in search and rescue operations for those amateur radio operators that are getting involved in this particular MCOM event. Uh, the most popular that I've seen polling the Sartrack mailing list is actually a pretty close race. Uh, the Kenwood TH-72s are very popular. Uh, they have a user accessible TNC, so you can use it for more than just APRS. You could use it for VHF or UHF packet wind link, or you could use it as just a plain packet station. You use it for several different things. Another nice feature of that particular Kenwood is it has the ability to digipede on the fly. So if you wanted to expand your network, you could do that. The other radio I heard a lot about when I was polling the Sartrack folks, the people that subscribe to that mailing list, is a device from a company called Sane Sonic. You can find this on eBay, on Amazon. Basically, this is a purpose-built device um, to receive packets. It's got a built-in TNC, and then it's designed to communicate that information via Bluetooth to um, a, a, an Android tablet or phone that's running APRS Droid, just as we saw in some of those previous examples. The downside with this device is it's a very low transmit power. I believe it's one watt, but there were plenty of people that swore by it. And this device also, with the flip of a switch, can be changed to digipede. So if you have a small search group, I mean, theoretically, you could have every searcher out there digipeding. Now, every time you do that, you're dramatically increasing the saturation of the network but maybe you've shifted off to your own frequency. You're not using 144.39. You've got another frequency that you're using, and maybe that works for you. There were several teams for whom that did work. The radio that our team is uh, beginning to work with is a newer radio. It's the Yezu FTM, sorry, FT2DR. And one of the reasons that we're looking at it is in addition to the built-in APRS features, you have a more uh, graphical, uh, screen that you can use to make it easier for searchers to see and understand the information they're, they're receiving. But also, with the Yezu system fusion features built into it, uh, we can transmit a little bit more data on our voice frequency without interrupting that voice frequency. We can use the group mode to give uh, another uh, uh, position, direction, distance uh, report between the different radios and try and help increase the likelihood that a nearby searcher received a packet from a missing searcher or um, is able to close with and find a particular point that's been identified a little bit quicker. So there's several options out there. Um, I recommend you look at all of them and weigh what's best for your club based off of features, price, durability, and user reviews. This has been K7DCC. If you have any questions for me, I can be reached at 
Kilo 7 Delta Charlie Charlie at ARRL Amateur Radio Relay League dot org. I'm always happy to answer questions or leave comments below and I will address those as quickly as I can. Thank you.